John, I, I know we've made the big, big time. Here, here's how I know. Jake Brown brought me, who's our great producer, one of our great producers, brought me and my second 20-ounce cup of coffee today, <laughs> 20 ounces of love. If the company that makes this uses 20 ounces of love in their advertising, I want a little piece of that. Uh, I know we made it because we're going, you and I are both going to the All-Star Game. We'll be doing a, our podcast, the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman from Los Angeles next Tuesday. Uh, guests to be announced. And on the subject of guests to be announced, we're doing a show at the Paley Center Monday July 25th, the Paley Center is on 52nd Street for anyone who doesn't know that, uh, big auditorium. That's the day before the first Subway series. Obviously, we'll be fo focusing on that, and our guests will be focusing on that. Uh, if you're a Post Sports uh, Plus member, you can get free tickets until July 15th, and then after July 15th, it's open to the general public. So, John, we have some interesting shows coming up in interesting places but we're back here today. We have Sandy Alderson on the show. And I mentioned we're going to the All-Star Game this week. It's 30-plus for me. I'm sure it's 30-plus for you. So we're here to fix it. <laughs> How do we, you know, like when we were kids, we couldn't wait for that Tuesday, right? Yeah. Like, like it wasn't on television all the time. The idea of seeing Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Reggie Jackson, et cetera, was big. How, how, how do, can we make this more exciting for our, our fans moving forward? Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't even say fix it because, you know, of the All-Star games, the Major League Baseball All-Star game is by far the best. The other ones, they need fixing. They even do a Pro Bowl. I don't even know. They would even do a Pro Bowl. It's so I, bad. Yeah. Nobody watches. And I get I mean, it's the nature of the sport, right? It's dangerous to play football, and to do it as an exhibition makes little sense. I, I think baseball has generally done a great job with the All-Star game. I'm looking forward to it. You're right. I look forward to it as a kid. But there are a couple things that I would add, and I, I think I'm stealing this from one of the other sports, which does not hold a great all-star game. I'm not sure it's the NBA or the NFL, because you're the one who follows everything, so you know. I would do, add, I think the home run derby has been become good. I didn't like it initially. I whined about it. I complained. And I'm going to be fixing the home run derby. Okay, good. You can fix it. I, I, I think it's gotten better. I, they do it now on time instead of swing, so that was a great change when they did that, so... I like the home run derby. I'd like to see more skills competition. I'd like to see a running competition. I'd like to see a throwing competition, like throw from right field into a cup or something like that. There are guys who can do it. Uh, I, I would like to see more of that. So I, I do like the home run derby. I like it as is. We'll see what you have to say about that. But I want to see more skills competitions. So I, I'm going to talk about skills competition in a second also because I, I, I've got something for that that you're going to absolutely hate. But for the home run derby, one of the participants should be through the through the July 4th fireworks whoever has the longest home run of the season should be an automatic bid into the home run derby because you might get a rocky story it would be this year Jesus Sanchez of the Marlins has a 496 yes. foot homer it would be great to see him yeah. in the derby it's like a rocky story and i uh, you know we know this from our history Hitting a home run in batting practice is different from it. It's like Jim Leveritz was great at it. Wade Boggs was great at it. Ichiro was great at it. People who you don't think. I would do that. On a skills competition, Wednesday is one of the deadest days in the sports calendar, right? The, the day after the All-Star game. What if we had, like, a major league skills competition of other sports that day? Would people be interested in seeing... Let's have a three-point contest of major league players who want to participate. Let's have a closest to the pin for the golf. Let's have a throw a football through a tire, and you could compete in any of them, and the guy who does the best in all three is the overall champion, but you have champions in all of it. I think people would watch that. Well, it sounds like you're bringing back superstars. That, that's Remember what that? it's, I was yeah, thinking I mean, of superstars. You know, we're, we're aging ourselves now. Yes. I don't think most of any... any we talked about the 1970s quite a lot before the show. Under 50, uh, they're not going to remember. We, superstars was a great competition on TV. Uh, I, By I don't the way, that's one. like the coffee, John. If they actually steal that idea, like <laughs> it's got to be the Joel Sherman Invitational or something. <laughs> uh, sure, I, I think so. Uh, I got, go you, you got another one? I got one more. Go ahead. So it's... If we're going to move the draft into to the Sunday before the All-Star game, and we're this close to the trading deadline anyway, and everyone is trying to figure out how to marry those two things, they should make it that you could trade draft picks now, the regular draft picks, because it's very hard for people to watch that show because as opposed to the NBA and the NFL, which have 
bigger college platforms yeah. that people watch. But, I mean, college baseball is more popular now than ever, but it's never going to be college football or college basketball where we know the players. Plus, the second the draft is over, those players go to play in small towns all over the country and are years away from playing. To me, John, if you or I suddenly are on Twitter with a rumor, the Mets are talking to the Brewers about trading the 11th and 14th pick for Josh Hader. You know, or something like that. Yeah, I don't People know are watching you. the draft that night. I don't know about you, but I've been shut down about uh, uh, telegraphing uh, draft picks in advance. So, right. uh, you know, just like the NFL, right? Didn't ESPN yeah. shut them down about that? They don't want to give it away. So I, I'm not sure. The, the, what I've heard about the draft, I, I, I don't mind that they've done it here and it's going to be good in terms of marketing and selling and certainly baseball is listening to what people are saying. But for the actual draft players, and the scouts, they think the draft should be back where it was. Yes. Not yeah, yeah, so I, I, I'm i kind of understanding of them, and I, I kind of agree with them that it shouldn't even be here. But now that it is, I, I think it will help in terms of marketing. So there will be a positive to it, but to have these players not play for a month and all that, uh, not so great for baseball. Yeah, but I think the only way that people, the average fan, will watch it you know, is if, I, if 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 somehow current players and current teams, in other words, if you're yeah, I you're, understand. You're I the don't Orioles. Think... Say you, say you're the Orioles right now, and you don't like anyone at the top of this draft, and you're willing to trade the number one draft pick for maybe somebody who's at Double A AA or Triple A who could help them the rest of the year. You know, or a young starting pitcher someplace. I, I don't know. I think yeah. that buzz would get people interested. I, I'm not sure that it would. I I personally think there should be buzz, and I I do think I I hope the Orioles like some of these players at the top of the draft you've got Andrew Jones's son who's supposed to be spectacular I mean Mark Dur- Holiday's Mark, son Mark Jackson Holiday I remember him as a little kid in Jupiter running around had no idea he was going to be a potential number one pick I think most people think they should take Drew Jones the center fielder out of Georgia obviously Andrew's son so I mean to me that should get people excited enough um you Except know, for they then disappear from our conscious for a couple yeah, of years. That's unfortunately that's the nature of you baseball. Know, the guys it who were just while. taken in the NBA draft, yeah. they're playing summer league. People are interested in summer league because two months from right. now they're going to be in NBA camps for their actual teams. In our sport, the skill is such a honed skill that you've yeah. got to go through the rookie A double A kind of uh grinder. So I think they fall out of our our eyesight and consciousness. Uh John, we have Sandy Alderson coming on our show today, and we thought that would give us an ability. Again, one of the things about us is we've been doing this for a long time, about 70 years combined, and so we've been through a lot of executives. We played the game last week. Which players we've liked and disliked covering the most? How about executives? Let's We'll, we'll go against our nature. Who's the executive <laughs> you've liked covering the most in your time? Yeah, and this was brief because you, you remember that in the Steinbrenner years, uh, the executives didn't last very long. Oh, but I, I love this guy, uh, George Bradley. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you picked him, but he was fantastic. What a, what a great guy. Um, you know, he did not last long. He did not get another chance. Uh, I don't think they called him general manager. Those, you know, Steinbrenner always had two guys who were basically the general manager. But one not in New really. York, one in Tampa. And they, they were always fighting. For and each, his and George was the guy in Tampa, and he was great to deal with. I mean, always, you know, just a friendly, nice guy. And, of course, you know, he didn't last very long. And, unfortunately, he's passed on since. Uh, he was a rather heavy fellow, but very nice guy. And uh, I miss him. I really like George Bradley. He's my favorite all time. I've got some more recent ones too, if we get to them. But uh, go ahead. Who's your Who's your favorite? So George Bradley is a good one. I'm going to pick a guy who was very brief as a GM in town, also. But before I do this, I just want to give you an idea of just in my time as a columnist, which is 1996 forward. Here have been the Met general managers: Joe McElvain, Steve Phillips, Frank Cashin as an interim, Steve Phillips, Jim Duquette, Omar Minaya. John Rico is an interim. Sandy Alderson, then when Sandy was gone, it was a combination of interims. John Rico, Omar Minaya, J.P. Ricciardi. Brody Van Wagnen, Jared Porter for seven minutes. Zach Scott, interim, not very long. Alderson again, and Billy Epler. And in that group, a short term, just in 2004, I love dealing with Jim Duquette. Oh, I just yeah, love, he's in our <laughs> business now. I just think... It's very difficult to skirt, especially in our town, that middle ground between being a good person and honest while also protecting your organization and not giving away the nuclear codes. And I thought for the brief time he did that, the gym was spectacular at it. Yes. Like he answered the phone. 
if you had good information, he didn't do, I think me and you are going to probably talk about, what's a funny story, right? Uh, uh, people who, even if you have the right information, <laughs> lie to you about right. it. Um, Jim never did that. Incredibly decent and honest and available. And I don't think when you do what we do, you could ask for more. Absolutely. Jim Duquette was fantastic. Um, just uh, terrific. You know what's odd, I think, is a lot of people, and I'm great. it's great that he's in the media, a lot of people who end up going in the media were terrible with the media. Yeah. I mean, this goes to the players, too. I mean, Nomar Garcia Parr was probably the We didn't mention him. We did the players, the worst players to deal with, because I had Albert Bell. I mean, the guy was, you know, right. borderline insane. Nomar Garcia Parr was sane, but he was just terrible to deal with. Now he's in the media, and that happens too frequently. I think these guys get jobs in the media after treating the media poorly for 15 or 20 years. Uh, Duquette, I'm glad to see he's in the media. Now I've got, uh, we're going to go to the negative side. I've yeah. got a couple guys who are in the media who I did not like dealing with. I got a long list of guys I didn't like dealing with, but what's funny is, of course, I have a big mouth. I blurted out who I really disliked dealing with. And we agree. We, we had the same guy. It was amazing. From three decades ago, we, we picked the same. Go ahead. Same you go ex- first, and I'll tell my, sto- my I mean, story. I'll, I'll tell mine, too. It's Bob Quinn, uh, who was briefly a Yankee GM, but I did not know him as the Yankee GM or whatever his title was with the Yankees. Uh, I came in 90. He might have been there in 89. I'm not sure. But um, even from afar, uh, he was an incredible liar. I, I feel I apologize to him. He is eight, about 85 years old. Uh, he's living. But just amazing. You know, in that job, I understand there's a lot of times they really can't reveal what's going on. But uh, my story is, in, in I remember on December 7th, 1992, Tom Verducci and I had the story that While you the were Giants, Newsday. right, a Newsday, that Barry Bonds had a big offer from the Giants. And if the Yankees didn't match it, he was going to go to the Giants. And, I mean, you know, I, we were a little nervous about the story because it came from unnamed sources. And I remember the next day, Murray Chaz, being industrious, went and talked to everybody in baseball to try to find out, and he he was unable to find out, which was, that was a benefit that Bob Quinn lied to him about this. So that was good. But then the following day, Bob Quinn publicly lied about it. You know, he issued a statement that we're not interested in Barry Bonds when the deal was basically done at th- that point. And... Uh, you know, I had some dealings with him, and he really, really never told the truth. It was just not in his nature to ever tell the truth. And this is a guy, this I think a four-generation sports executive guy. He was the third generation of general managers. And uh, I don't know what the other two did. I'm not quite that old, but uh, he was very memorable for his lying. Yeah, me, me too, John. Uh, I can't believe, like, I... I we usually try to not tell each other what we're going to do. <laughs> I got a big and, mouth. And we just blurted it out. And I was like, how are you picking Bob Quinn, too? <laughs> We've covered so many executives. So I came on the Yankee beat in May of 1989. The co-general managers were Sid Riff and Bob Quinn. George Bradley was in Tampa at that point. He wasn't quite as powerful as he would become the next year when you came on the beat. It was really Quinn and Thrift. And I didn't know what I was doing. I was 24, 25 years old. Those two guys never told me the truth. They wouldn't have told me today was Tuesday. <laughs> like, and I'll tell you the my ultimate Bob Quinn full of it story. I didn't have many good stories that year. All right, I did again. I didn't know what I was doing. The Yankees late in August traded John Candelaria to the uh, Montreal Expos. This is how long ago it was for a player to be named later. I again think of the age. I pick up a phone. I just call call the Expos. I get an executive there who, by the way, is still an executive in the major leagues. I won't say it because we're, uh-huh. we were off the record then. I'm going to honor it now. And he's, I said, hey, you know, like I'm trying to find out. The guy says, look, he's traded for a guy named Mike Blowers, but we don't want to announce it yet because our AAA team's in the playoffs and we want him to finish out the year and then he's going to be the player to be named later. Now, I had never dealt with the person on the other end of the phone that dealt with Bob Quinn and said, so I went to Bob Quinn and I said, Bob, uh, I'm going to write, I heard that the player to be named later is Mike Blowers. And Bob Quinn, with a straight face looking at me, again, I shouldn't, whatever, because he never told me the truth, goes, Joel, not only is it not Mike Blowers, but we have a list of five names we could pick from, and Mike Blowers isn't one of them. 
And I'm sitting there going, well, what do I do now? So I hedge it in the story. It could be, there's a list of five, whatever. Of course, the AAA playoffs land, and, and it's Mike Blowers. <laughs> and so I just go to Bob Quinn, and I go, look, I'm probably getting fired at the end of this season. I suck at this. <laughs> but, like, between now and then, if there's a way I could get you, I'm going to get you. Like, <laughs> like this is... This is ridiculous. Did you get him? Nah, I, I told him I was going to blame even rainouts on him. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, look, I, I, I just, it's why I like people like Jim Duquette. You know, Brian Cashman in a pretty stressful job for a quarter of a century. Yeah. He just doesn't do stuff like that. No. Like, he might not help you, but he'll never hurt you on purpose. Like, like, can we at least have a relationship where if I have integrity with you yeah. and I'm honest with you about my information, can you... I, again, I don't expect you to tell me something that hurts your job, but to blatantly lie, just at that moment go, well, I'm not going to comment, or it's a complicated situation, whatever. Yeah, and now did you not get him? Then he was rewarded by getting the San Francisco Giants, Giants job. GM job later. So, uh, you know, he, he learned to lie, and it certainly benefited him, and he continued to do it even in San Francisco. Um, I feel a little guilty. He is 85 years old. Yeah. Hopefully he doesn't uh, listen, listen to, to our podcasts, podcasts but uh, he may. And John, he this does, is where we're different. You finally I got hope him. he's listening to the well, podcast. Well, you finally got him 30 years later. So yeah. good I job. couldn't blame a rain out on him, but I got him with this. <laughs> when we come back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman, an executive we do like to deal with, Mets president Sandy Alderson. Back on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman, our special guest this week is the president of the New York Mets, Sandy Alderson. Sandy, Thank you so much for joining us this week. And uh, as, as we speak to you, Sandy, your team is in first place. We're beyond the halfway point of the season. We're getting close to the trade deadline. You did an awful lot in the offseason. I wonder if you could just give us an overview of where you think your ball club is right now. Well, I think that, uh, first of all, <clears throat> we've got a good team. Um, and we're playing uh, we're playing reasonably well. Um, <clears throat> we've had some <coughs> uh, players unavailable to us, either for injury or uh, <clears throat> birth of a first child or <laughs> uh, a variety of other uh, reasons. And um, so that's had an impact on us. But everybody has those um, uh, issues to deal with. And, you know, I think that we played really well in April and May. We played okay in uh, June and early July, but I think as we get some players back, hopefully we can you know, re regain that momentum and uh, play well the second half. Sandy, as we talked to you, it's obviously July. We're only a few weeks away from the uh, trade deadline. Sorry. Sorry. As we talked to you, uh, we're in July. Obviously we're only two to three weeks away from the trade deadline. And so I should ask you, I mean, obviously it's a good team. It's a first place team. A lot has gone right. Uh, you made some good signings in the, in the winter. Um, obviously now there's a lot of work to be done for everybody in the summer. Um, do you know where you stand now? We don't obviously know exactly where DeGrom stands. Um, Scherzer has been great. Uh, I think the pitching has been really good, but uh what do you think you need going into the deadline? Can you tell at this point whether you need a starting pitcher? I think Joel and I probably agree that a, a hitter could be something that you need. Uh, would you say that a, a starting pitcher is something you're going to look at as well? Well, <clears throat> you know, the equation is is partly defined by need, and it's also partly defined by cost. And when I say cost, it's... <clears throat> you know, can be monetary, but also can be player related. So, you know, looking at the starting pitching, um, starting pitching has not really been an issue for us over the last six weeks. I mean, we haven't, it hasn't been uniformly great, but it hasn't been uh, bad in certain spots that would force us to go look for a starting pitcher. Because look, starting pitching is going to be very expensive to acquire at the deadline. It's um, something that most clubs would be looking for. Um, <clears throat> so will we look at the possibility of adding starting pitching? Yep, probably depending on where we are with, uh, you know, Scherzer's coming back. Grom should be back about that time. 
you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> but I think, you know, what we're going to look to do is um, <clears throat> add where we can. And look, we, we've got among the lowest DH product productivity in the game, take Alonzo out of it. And it's been, you know, very poor. Um, <clears throat> is DH, you know, a spot that's going to be highly competitive in the marketplace? I don't know. Maybe. I doubt it. Doesn't mean that, you know, some team in our division might not try to hold us up <laughs> for a top <laughs> prospect. But, um, but anyway, um, <clears throat> again, I think there's probably an opportunity to improve there. Um, and then the bullpen just needs to be, uh, I think, uh, strengthened. Um, you've probably noticed we've lost, I don't know, three or four games at least in the last 20 games with home runs late in the game after the starters departed. Um, that can't continue with a championship team. We can't just keep giving up. Uh, bombs that you know determine outcomes uh so is 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 the bullpen an area that we probably look at yeah and the other thing about the bullpen is those acquisitions are all, aren't always that expensive either and and when i say that it's you know again we want to try to preserve the prospects we have we've got some good ones um we traded one last year if you call it the deadline um to the cubs uh, Pete Crow Armstrong. He was hurt at the time. Um, but today he's ranked like 40th um, among all prospects in baseball. So we got to be careful about, you know, who we move and for what reasons. So I, I, to make, to, to, to give you a short answer, I'd say a hitter and maybe some bullpen help. Sandy, Primarily. excuse me, Sandy, Sandy, within that answer, you mentioned uh, Jacob deGrom. Uh, he's been one of the mysteries of the season. I wonder if you could help us unbundle the mystery, not only when he might pitch, but it's come up. Does he like being a New York Met? Do you think he wants to be a New York Met? Do you think he wants to pitch as much as he can this year? Do you think he wants to pitch enough to go out into free agency? Well, what do you think is his status right now? Well, right now, as we speak, his status is close. And um, I think, you know, everything points toward a return toward the end of the end of the month uh, at the latest. That could change. Um, is he motivated to pitch? Is he motivated to pitch for the New York Mets? Yes, I think he is. Um, <clears throat> uh, it'd be hard not to be motivated in that way, given the way the rest of the team has performed. So. Um, <clears throat> I think he definitely wants to be part of that. And, and, you know, hopefully he will be in the next couple of weeks. Do, do, if I could just follow on that real quick, do you think it changes your, ch I, I mean, your chances, the dynamic, do you still, the team was built with some belief of Scherzer to Grom, to Grom Scherzer. Does that change the dynamic of the 2022 Mets significantly if you have those two guys going round and round for 40% of your starts the rest of the way? I think, I think yes, absolutely yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, having those, those two guys pitching every fifth, fifth day, uh, <clears throat> there's no question. And the way, you know, Walker is pitching and – you know, Bassett and, and uh, <coughs> Carrasco are pitching pretty well. You know, that's a great rotation. Now we got to score some runs. You know, our run productivity has been way down. Um, we've got to get productivity out of the bottom third of our order. When we get productivity, some at least, out of the bottom three spots in the order, um, we, we score a lot of runs because we create opportunities with the top five or six, but sometimes we have to cash in with the bottom two or three. And when that doesn't happen, you know, because our DH is, you know, got a 550 uh, OPS or, um, you know, we're not getting productivity out of the, the ninth spot 
in most cases, the catcher, you know, it's a big difference. So, um, <clears throat> so we've got to score some runs as well. And we've got to do that. We did it early in the year with a, uh, you know, a lineup one through nine that was productive, you know, in, in, in uh, relative ways, depending on, you know, <clears throat> who we're talking about, but generally productive up and down the line. Um, and we've got, to, we've got to figure out a way to get back to that. You mentioned the, the acquisition cost. Um, I think you're referring a little to the money, but also to the prospects. You know, I think people look at the Mets uh, system and it certainly has improved. I think you're right in the middle of the pack at this point. Um, you've got five guys that people really like, starting with Alvarez, obviously Mauricio and Allen uh, Beatty. Um, those are, I think, four out of the five. Um, are, are those guys completely off limits in terms of trade? And also, you know, you got $290 million right now, approximately uh, payroll tied with the Dodgers. You know, when I talked to Steve Cohn a few weeks ago at the owner's meeting, he said, you know, they're open. To, he's open to thinking about anything. Uh, where do you think you stand in terms of the budget um, as well? So two, two parts there, um, those prospects off limits and how flexible are you in terms of the budget? Well, there's no question that some of our prospects are off limits. I mean, we just promoted uh, Francisco Alvarez. Uh, I'd be surprised if there were anything <laughs> that would make him available. Brett Beatty is very close to that status as well. And then you're talking about, you know, Matt Allen hasn't pitched in a couple of years. It's easy to just say, all right, he hasn't pitched. Who knows what he's going to be? Let's move him. Well, <clears throat> I can tell you from experience, a few years ago, uh, there was kind of a tendency, uh, you know, and I take some responsibility for this, to, well, the guy's not going to help us this year, so let's move him. Well, you know, we had a deal for Brandon Nemo at some point, uh, who wasn't playing at the time because of a bad knee uh, and was out for quite a while. Uh, we had another deal possibility for Zach Wheeler at the time when he was way, you know, he was. He was not performing. Uh, he was hurt. Uh, you got to be careful about, you know, discounting the value of certain guys just because they're hurt. And so um, Matt Allen's a sort of a good example of that. P. Crow Armstrong was an example of that as recently as last year. So I can't sit here and tell you that everybody is going to be off limits or unavailable, but um, I think we're going to be very judicious. And I think that's the approach that Steve wants to take. I think that he's he wants to be very careful about moving prospects because moving prospects ultimately affects our ability to sustain success. Um, you can't do it just with money. Sandy, you uh, mentioned Steve's name a few times. You mentioned from experience, it's hard to ignore. Your experience includes being a general manager under the previous ownership, the, you know, Fred and Jeff Wilpon and Sal Katz, and now you are here with Steve Cohn. Uh, is this just a new day? Is it dramatically different what's possible to do and how you do it with this ownership? Well, I think that the, the, the possibilities are definitely broader. Um, on the other hand, the way you approach decision making has to be similar, simply because you have to be prudent, you have to be um, careful, you have to be patient. All of those qualities, I think, still pertain. So, um, so from my standpoint, yeah, we have a broader set of possibilities, but you have to bring the same sort of decision making approach to those possibilities, and. Uh, I think that's something that Steve requires, and it's not that dissimilar from what the Wilpons required either. It's just that the opportunities for us to consider are much broader. Would you like it to be those opportunities? You mentioned trying to protect your system, and you've mentioned a few times regret with Pete Crow Armstrong. Is this a time maybe to, you, to protect the top of your system by being who out there is making some money who we like? who a team is looking to get out of. And that's an area we can flex a little where maybe some other organization or your previous ownership wouldn't do that. And, or current ownership of other teams wouldn't, is this a time 
in your cycle of where the Mets are right now to flex financial muscle like you did in the offseason, also at the trade deadline? I think that's a possibility, yes. Um, I think I think right now that we would err on the side of money as opposed to erring on the side of prospects. Um, um, So, um, yes, I think that's 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 a real possibility, whether it'll actually happen in the in the context of a real deal that we're looking at. um, You know, who knows? Sandy, you mentioned uh, the DH need a couple of times, and I think Joel and I both um, noticing we've been to a number of Mets games and uh, yeah, obviously uh, um, not getting as much production out of the DH as would have envisioned at the beginning of the year. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Alvarez is generally thought of as the top prospect in the system. He's a 20-year-old catcher. You know, it might be tough to have a 20-year-old catcher catching uh, Scherzer and presumably DeGrom when he's back and and that whole veteran staff of yours. But um, could Alvarez potentially be that DH for you? Because he is seems to be hitting very well in the minor leagues. And the other question I had was, uh, you know, it looks like two of the options for DH could be with a team in your division. And I, I You don't have to speak to this, but, you know, I think we all know that the Nats are a seller. At this stage, um, you know, you've got Josh Bell having a fantastic year, uh, could be a DH. He's first baseman for them, but could be a DH. And of course, they have one of the all time great DHs, Nelson Cruz there as well. Uh, have you found it difficult to trade within the division, even for a rental? Um, is that something that's an issue or I'm, you know, I would think that's a possibility. The Nats and Alvarez look like two of the possibilities for DH. So with respect to Alvarez, you know, he was just moved to AAA. Um, he's only played two or three games. Uh, he's on his way to the Futures game. Um, but in those two or three games, he's, you know, he's, he's getting his feet wet. You know, he's, he's only had 15 or 16 played appearances, a couple of hits. Um, <clears throat> uh, he has been shown some discipline at the plate. But in order for Alvarez to be considered, we'd have to see sustained performance over some period of time. And right, you know, at AAA, and and we haven't seen that Um, because he hasn't had the opportunity to do it. So I would say that's not an immediate option. That's not something we we would rely on. Um, I mean, look, we have, we have a couple of, options one we can go with what we have <laughs> we've been waiting all season for you know, one or two of those players to to ignite and that hasn't happened um <clears throat> and we can as a second option we can pursue somebody internally which at this point would most likely be you know an alvarez maybe a Beatty, maybe a vientos um <clears throat> but that's not something we want to rely on either. I mean, that's, that's not a fail safe option. Mm -hmm. Um, And the third is to acquire somebody outside. And um, look, it's, you know, it's fairly obvious who the DH candidates are. Um, There are a handful of them and they're, you know, and they're uh, pretty easily easy to identify. So, you know, in evaluating what it ought to cost to acquire those players. You know, part of it is analyzing the market. Who else is looking for a DH? Can't be that many teams in the running looking for a DH. Um, But, you know, one or two might pop up. I think what's, what you know, whether it's in the division or out of the division, I think the tendency in some cases is is to throw out a, name or a couple of names that you know <clears throat> as a let's see whether they bite or not i don't think we're at the point yet where um <clears throat> and again this is billy Epler's bailiwick um i don't think we're at the point where we know what the cost is going to be for an outside s- solution uh in the division or out of the division so we'll just have to see and part of it's going to depend on okay what is the marketplace 
who's out there competing for a DH and maybe you can identify one or two teams. Yeah. Uh, they don't come immediately to mind. Uh, you mentioned Billy Epler. Uh, you, you guys had a bit of a tortured recent history trying to get to a head of baseball operations before finally getting to Billy this off season. I wonder as a longtime general manager yourself and his direct boss, how do you think he's doing? I think he's, I think he's doing very well. Um, you know, a general manager's general manager is, is evaluated in a variety of different ways. Um, one is basically talent acquisition and, you know, that relates to talent evaluation as well as the ability to actually acquire somebody. Um, <clears throat> and that comes up mostly in the off season and it comes up at the trade deadline. Uh, I think by most measures and obviously not perfect, but, uh, our off season was very productive and um, under difficult circumstances, given the amount of time that Billy had to actually talk with players, acquire players before the uh, uh, work stoppage. Um, anyway, it was, it was great. And, you know, part of that was Steve pushing because Steve wanted to change the narrative uh, for the Mets for um, the work stoppage set in. Um, the other time, you know, you know, the other time where acquisition is, is, uh, highlighted is, you know, at the trade deadline and we'll see how that goes, but I'm very confident that, you know, he'll handle it well. Um, otherwise, you know, it's the day-to-day -day management of the roster and, um, the relationship with the manager, um, you know, those, uh, sort of I call them housekeeping, but, uh, you know, the things that keep the train running. And uh, he's very detail oriented. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think he's done a great job, you know, managing the waiver wire, managing uh, our roster, given some of the challenges we've had with, with injuries. I think he's done an excellent job with that too. So um, <clears throat> uh, from my standpoint, you know, I'm very pleased with what he's been able to do. You know, Sandy, I'm going to follow up with a related question. Um, you know, I would agree. Agree. I mean, not that my opinion matters here, but Billy seems to have done a great job. So has Buck. Both seem to be great hires. Obviously, you've been in charge in a few different places now. San Diego, obviously, Oakland a long time <clears throat> there. Twice with the Mets now. You've done a lot of hiring in, in baseball. I think you've made some of the best hires, you know, ever. Uh, Billy Bean, uh, we knew him as an advanced scout. Um, and then, you know, obviously, he's become legendary. Um, you mentored him and uh, obviously famous for Moneyball, although I think you get partial credit for that. Um, you hired Tony La Russa, obviously Buck and Billy. Uh, there were a couple, I think, that didn't work out so perfectly. We, we were here all here for Mickey Calloway that obviously didn't turn out. Um, first of all, I was wondering, did you think when you interviewed Billy for the G general manager job of the Mets, did you think you had a chance to get him? And also just generally... How difficult it is to hire in baseball? It seems you're like you're under a time constraint that isn't true in, in uh, any other walk of life, um, and I think that probably makes it difficult. Although, I mean, your track record is by and large pretty good. Well, uh, first of all, with respect to Billy, yeah, I thought we had a pretty good chance, uh, and that was based on his initial response to us. Um, but I think that eventually he realized that he had a good situation in Oakland, both from a professional standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint. Um, so, uh, you know, that was kind of the cold reality, but yeah, we thought we, you know, had a pretty good chance there. Had, um, so uh, it wasn't, you know, fool's gold that we were pursuing. It was, there, there was a legitimate possibility there for a week or 10 days. Um, as far as, uh, um, you know, the, the situation in baseball, there's no question that, you know, baseball has individual clubs have done everything they can to, um, tie up 
um, executives that they feel, you know, contribute to their individual success or <laughs> contribute just to their continued operation. It's almost impossible to hire somebody from inside the game. Um, and I'll tell you why twofold. One is some guys are just tied up and, and, and individual club owners don't want to let them go. And so they trade multi-year contracts and the security of those contracts for the fact that, you know, those individuals aren't going to interview anyplace else. They're not going to be uh, allowed to do it. The second is that I think a lot of executives in the game have become very risk averse and <clears throat> happy to be in a, in a situation where, you know, not on the firing line, not sub, not in New York, not, you know, subject to this, subject to that, just, you know, overly cautious. And I guess I, you know, I get that, you know, uh, somebody in his or her thirties or forties with young kids want to pick up and go elsewhere. But I think this risk aversion actually permeates the entire industry <laughs> because that's, you know, that, you know, the game has turned on two basic themes, probability and efficiency. And that hasn't always been the case. It's easier to keep your job if you focus on efficiency and don't challenge the probabilities. And I think what's happened is, the, you know, the game has suffered as a consequence. Um, <clears throat> we all play it the same way. You know, we all got basically the same approach to the game. Um, <clears throat> we all see the players the same way. You know, everybody wants your top 100 prospects, you know, blah, blah, blah. I just think that it's become very risk averse industry. Sandy, uh, as a way to wrap this up, uh, first of all, I should define our Billies. We were talking about two Billies at one time. You were talking about Billy Bean of the A's when there was a seven day to a seven to 10 day period uh, when you yes. thought that there right. might be a situation, not Billy Epler, who ultimately becomes yes. the general manager. <laughs> but yep. um, uh, just to, to, to put a bow on this uh, before you go, big picture, what do you like about the trajectory of the team? What has been, uh, over the last 12 months, one of the problems of the Mets historically is that it hasn't sustained that success like you had in 15 and to some degree 16 didn't become 17, 18, 19. That's yeah. the history of the team. It's never made the playoffs three straight years. Right. What? What has happened over your time back and with Steve owning the team that makes you believe sustainability that the Mets can become the Dodgers, can become the Yankees? Well, part of it obviously is resources. Um, I mean, let's face it, um, we're spending $290 million on player payroll this year, thereabouts. Um, 15 and 16, I'd have to go back. But my guess is that it was like half of that. Um, so resources, you know, change change the change the environment uh, for success and sustained success. Just um, the other thing we have to have is we have to have discipline to you know retain those resources that are going to lead to sustainability and then it gets me back to the farm system um our you know i think john mentioned our farm system is middle of the pack if you take i saw this the other day if you um if you look at uh the drafts of major league clubs all the way back to 2010 um and do it on a war basis we we the Mets rank second in all of baseball for the num you know for the amount of war created through the draft. That doesn't mean we benefited from it. We may have traded a player uh, or two, but we've actually done a really good job of scouting 
over that period of time. Um, <clears throat> but we've traded a lot of players. A lot of the players that we've, you know, scouted, we haven't held on to. And one of the risks is, you know, you draft a high school kid. You got to be patient with that kid for, you know, some period of time. You can't be tempted every year to trade him because he's two or three years away. You can't, you can't, you know, operate that way. Otherwise, you should just take college players because they're closer and they're less <laughs> attractive to trade. Um, so in any event, I think, you know, in terms of sustainability, one is resources. But two is, is discipline to some extent in, you know, in, in, in um, preserving those, those other resources in, a way, in, in the form of players. So anyway. Well, we'll see how it all plays out at the trade deadline this year and the future with the New York Mets. But in the present, John and I want to thank you, Sandy, for joining us on the show. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Enjoy. Sandy. John, to know and interview Sandy Alderson over the years is to know he's going to be interesting. He was with us. What'd you find? What'd you take out yeah. of this? What'd you find most interesting? Yeah. You know, the fact that he doesn't really feel like they need a starting pitcher. They'll look at it, he said. But, uh, you know, obviously Scherzer coming back and the way he did, they did a great job, certainly, with getting Walker a couple years ago, Bassett a, a year ago. Uh, their rotation is deeper than most, so they'll look at it. But they're focused on the designated hitter, which, I, I, as he kind of alluded to, there aren't going to be a ton of teams looking at that. You know, Milwaukee maybe stands out as a team that might do that. There probably are one or two others, but uh, – I. I think they're probably in good shape that way, and they won't have to trade one of their big prospects, which clearly they are hesitant to do to get that DH. Yeah, you know, J.D. Davis and Dom Smith, he mentioned without using names, he said, you know, we've been trying to get performance. Those two guys haven't given the performance at a high level uh, out of the hitting, so in general and in the DH spot in specific. He, you, you asked a question about Alvarez. It just feels like there's not enough time between now and August 2nd for him to build up the reps at AAA plate appearance-wise for them to be convinced that he could come up and hit in a pennant race. So I think they'll make make a trade. You know, one of the things I say to young reporters when they ask questions, say, which I know one of the things I say is, listen to people. They actually tell you things whether they know it or not. And he mentioned a few times Pete Crow Armstrong. Yeah. And to me, that means it sticks in his craw that they traded him for a rental last year in Glaber, uh, in um, Javier Bias. Bias. Yep. And that says to me they're not going, like if it's Wilson Contreras, like if he's their DH or Josh Bell, they're not giving up one of their better guys for that. He kept coming back to that idea, which to your point is Matt Allen. Let's not give up like an injured guy right. just because whatever. So I thought it was interesting how many times he came back to that specific name. Yeah, it's Allen, Beatty, and certainly Alvarez are the three that I, I think I'd be shocked at this point. If and Ramirez trained. has come up big in their okay. internal prospect rankings. Okay. Yeah. And, I mean, and there are DH options. There's two alone on, on the Nats. Uh, Cruz is not having a great year, so wouldn't cost a ton. Bell, who is having a very good year, was a borderline all-star, one of those snubs, which we didn't talk about today. But, you know, that that he would cost something pretty good, but they're obviously not going to give up one of those top three guys. And as you mentioned, Contreras could be a DH. And he would make sense, too, because right now, of course, you've got McCann is out again. You know, uh, to bring a catcher in would help. But I don't think they'll be getting him because I, I, I do think Contreras will will bring quite a bit and it'll, they'll prob- some, someone else will probably give up something pretty good to get him. You know, John, we'll be talking about this and more. We're doing a show from Los Angeles uh, next week. Uh, we're going out to the All-Star Game. We're both leaving uh, on Friday. We'll be there all weekend uh, through the All-Star Game on Tuesday. Follow us on Twitter at John Heyman and at Joel Sherman One. We'll tell you the details where the uh, the show will be. I hope people come to join us. Thank you for listening to the uh, to our baseball podcast, the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman, as always, ably produced by the great tandem of Jake Brown and Andrew Hartz. Uh, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Please give us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And write a nice review because John and I do, even though we tell mean (laughs) stories, we do have feelings and we're sensitive. Anyway, from Los Angeles next Tuesday, 
the Paley Center, July 25th. Uh, more details to come on that the day before uh, the first Subway Series of the season. Join us then and every Tuesday on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.